Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I'm Eki Tepsapornchai. Well, brother, it's good to have you back another week. Uh, we we missed last week because I was in, in your state, your neck of the woods. Um, yeah, that's right, which, at CMS. Yeah, and the, the weather was absolutely lovely for me. Um, I think it's Lots cold rain. and rainy for <laughs> everyone else, but um, yeah. Well, we're this week we're going to continue, uh, you know, our few episodes uh, in in sort of a, a counseling mode here, and uh, this week's episode is about marriage. Um, I am by no means a marriage guru, uh, you know. I've only been married married for about seven years, and uh, it's been wonderful, largely because my wife is wonderful. Uh, but the scripture has a lot to say about marriage, and God is an expert in marriage. Um, and so we don't have to be, we can go to his word, which is what we're going to do today. Yeah. Marriage, uh, one of the, um, it is one of those areas that any, any pastor at any church knows that the bulk of their counseling is probably going to be marital issues. And oftentimes those marital issues stem from just a, a lack of attention to God and his word. But, uh, marriage is an extremely important institution. It's our most important relationship here on earth for those who are in married relationships. Um, you are not described to be in a one flesh relationship in, with anyone else aside from that spouse that you marry. And that goes all the way back to uh, Genesis 2.24, and they shall become one flesh, um, that, that's man and woman, husband and wife. So very important uh, relationship. And of course, we know how hard relationships can be. And for marriage, that's the one relationship that you've got to be in it uh, 24-7. You know, for the rest of your life, and so a lot can come up, uh, but God's word will show us the way. Yeah, well, l- let's just go to the passage everyone's familiar with and just sort of dive in there, because it, in, in reality, uh, while this might not seem to some people as uh, being as important as just jumping right into marital issues, the, the foundation is actually the most important. How we understand God. And how God's created men and women and how God has arranged marriage um, is of the utmost importance. And if you get that wrong, um, then you're going to struggle in marriage. Um, And so everyone's familiar with the Ephesians passage. You go to Ephesians chapter five. Let me just read this. And we're just going to take these in order of how God deals with them, the wise person. And then uh, next week we'll, or the next episode we'll do on husbands. But so you go to chapter five, verse 22, it says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. That's a it's it's a powerful couple verses there, packed with really very deep, rich theological truths. Well, why don't you just unpack a, a little bit of, because this is unusual, right? I, I mean, what we're seeing here is, yeah, God is comparing <laughs> how wives submit to their husbands and how husbands and wives are to the relationship Christ has with the church. That sort of elevates right? How we view marriage here. Absolutely. And verse 22, and and we're talking about some very controversial verses now within the church. And I I don't think this is controversial uh, amongst those who believe the Bible um, and and they interpret it rightly. But there's a lot of movement of feminism within the church. There are a lot of people that are trying to push egalitarianism, uh, for example, uh, within the church. And, And so even before we take a look at this, I think it's good to just go back to the larger context that starts back in verse 15. And if you know the book of Ephesians, uh, the, the main command in Ephesians, the main purpose in Ephesians, I think is lined up right at the start of chapter four, when Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy hmm. of the calling by which you've been called. And so we know that the last three chapters of Ephesians being very application driven is about how we walk. 
And in verse 15, we have one of these many walk statements. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And then verse 18 goes on to say, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled by the Spirit. And the next few verses explain what that means to be filled by the Spirit, uh, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And so when we get to verse 22, and it says, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Um, some rightly point out in verse 22 that it literally just says wives to your husbands as to the Lord. The the command to be subject to is actually not there. But they go back to verse 21, where it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And there are a lot of egalitarians. And by, by the way, when I say egalitarian, I'm talking about people who believe that men and women are equal in every way, um, whereas complementarianism or we can just say biblical patriarchy. Um, the, the the biblical model is is that we are equal in value before a holy God, but we are not equal in our functions and our roles. We have distinct functions, distinct roles that are meant to complement one another. And so egalitarians will argue that verse 22 um, is really just an example of how wives and husbands are to be subject to each other. So they'll say wives and husbands need to be subject to each other, but verse 22, that's not what it says. Even if you look at it literally, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. So even though the um, command is not in there, I think it's implied by as to the Lord. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. And that's the number one thing when I talk to uh, wives in counseling, is that when you're subjecting yourself to the husband, it's really a subjection to the Lord first. If you're submitting to yeah. Jesus Christ, then you're going to submit to your husband. It doesn't mean your husband's perfect. It doesn't mean that he's making all wise decisions as Jesus Christ did. In fact, in many cases, he's probably very, very far from it. Um, but the commandment here is not conditional. It's not be subject to your husbands as long as he's doing things that are good in your eyes. But it simply says, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. And verse 23, I think, goes on to unpack this. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now, that's very important because for egalitarians— they don't have a verse that will point to wife being the head of the husband. They don't have a verse that shows us an example of how husbands are to submit to wives. What we have here is an example of wives submitting to husbands. Now, there are those who will accuse us, oh, this is the this is the misogyny that's in the kind of reform conservative circles. Um, but no, this is God's design. And, and just as we will speak to this in, in terms of this is God's good design and this is the best way that we should do it because this is exactly what God tells us. There are a lot of godly women, many of them that we know on Twitter, who will happily defend this as well, um, who, who say that this is God's design. And we'll get to the men's responsibility next week. It doesn't mean that men have a free ride. In fact, they, they in many ways, they have a greater responsibility. But so for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, and there we actually do see the word subject to, and that is in there. That's not merely just implied. But as the search, as as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So that's pretty thorough. It's not conditional. Um, it doesn't uh, imply that there's two way submission or two way subjection. Um, there's nothing in here that suggests uh, egalitarianism, uh, but this is very much the order that Paul prescribes. Yeah, I, it, this is one of the reasons why egalitarianism is is so so evil, and 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 I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that it, it, meaning to kind of poke the bear, but the reason that system is an evil system is because it attacks the image that we have of Christ and His bride. That that's what makes it so evil. Yeah. Um. And, and and so we've got to understand that, and that's why understanding this, the the picture of marriage being related to Christ and His bride, Christ and the church, is so vital when we start dealing with marital issues. Because if you misunderstand that, then everything else just doesn't quite line up. You know. And then you made a good point. The other thing is, you know, we come to scripture. And we ask the question, what does the scripture say? And we never start with how have people messed this up? 
right? I mean, so often the argument is not based upon what scripture does or doesn't say. It's based upon the abuses that have been seen. Well, everyone, you know, mankind has abused everything that can be abused. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that will always be true. And so, yes. if we based if we based what we believe on abuses, then w- then we would be our own gods, and we we would be all wicked gods because we would abuse that too, right? Um, and so, we just absolutely can't approach the subject of marriage or any other subject by saying, "Well, but look at the abuses." No. Uh, we need to deal with those things, and Scripture does deal with those things, but that's really irrelevant when we're talking about what is God's order and design for marriage, and that's where we have to start. So set those things aside and just simply ask the question, what is God ordained, what does the Scripture teach about it, and then we can get to have honest discussions, because, you know, that's often one of one of the prime feminist arguments is abuses right and does abuse happen it it does but you pointed this out um i I think very poignantly verse 22 that's an imperative and it's compared to the way wives submit to christ and so by rebelling against your husband you are in fact rebelling against god because that's the comparison and, and so this is meant to be not a harsh taskmaster. I think, and I'd love to hear your opinion, I think this is meant to be a comfort and a joy and something that encourages women, even when it's difficult, that they can say, yeah. I'm doing this first and foremost out of my love for Christ. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, this is the same for the Christian faith in general. Why do Christians suffer joyfully? Because we do it for the sake of Christ, and that changes our mentality, and it changes our perspective. So I suppose you could read this as being harsh, but I don't think that's the way it's meant. It's certainly not the way it's written, and and since it's being compared to subjection to Christ, we know he's not a harsh taskmaster, and so this ought to be something that when we grasp well, um, it, it becomes a motivation, right? I, I I know my husband's being difficult today, but I'm 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 going to submit to him because I I love Christ so much, um, and, and that changes the perspective. I think. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I think that's a great point. Um, the the sovereignty of God. Every counseling session I have always um, includes the sovereignty of God and trusting in God's good purposes uh, in your life. And the great thing about the sovereignty of God, and I know a lot of people rebel against it, they they hate that idea, at least the way we believe in it. Um, but I, I think the sovereignty of God, rightly understood, should give us comfort, um, because we understand that God is ultimately in control. And as we look at that command, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, we understand that our submission, at least for the, the submission of the wives to the husbands, um, is tied to their submission to the Lord. And, and this is where wives are called to trust in the Lord. You know, it's not in your control. You, you know, the success of of um, the decisions that your husband might make, it, it's not it's not up to you actually. You know, so you just all, all you need to do is to trust in the Lord um, and to submit to your husband. And obviously, there is a the exception that's not listed here, but we understand the exception is that if the husband causes the wife to sin in a way that it, it well, if the husband causes the wife to sin in any way against the Lord. Yeah, uh, you obey the Lord first. So if there's a if there's a, a contradiction there or a disagreement there, you go with obviously you go with what the Lord says. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I I agree with you completely. And in fact, as I'm thinking about this passage, I can't help but to also think of First uh, Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three verses mm-hmm. one through four talks about wives uh, who have husbands are being who are being disobedient to the word. Right. And what's the command there? It, it's not to correct him. It's not to find someone to scold him or to punish him or to discipline him. It says in chapter three, first Peter three, verse one, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your husband so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without the word by the behavior of their mm-hmm. wives. So there is a beautiful submission that continues to happen, even if the husbands are not walking with the Lord. And again, I'm not talking about the case where the husband is trying to force the wife to sin against the Lord, but that he himself is being disobedient. And so there is a beautiful picture here 
And I've seen it many times in real life where there are couples who have wonderful marriages, but it wasn't always that way. And in many cases, I've seen cases where the husband was not walking with the Lord, but the wife ended up winning him over just by being a, a godly wife, uh, being devoted to the husband and, and loving the husband despite uh, the husband's failures. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that that really is a beautiful picture of the power of godliness in a wife, right? The fact that as, as a wife submits and honors her husband the way Scripture um, commands, that there's opportunity and chance that that may be the thing God uses to turn her husband's heart. That that's powerful. Um, but, uh, but that's born out of, right. And the presupposition is, is when we come to this chapter in, in Ephesians is that the wife is a God fearing woman who is subject yes. first to Christ. Right. And so if that's out of line, um, then, then that has to be fixed first. And we do see this, and this is often a challenge in the egalitarian community. Uh, and in fact, I have never seen it otherwise, um, right. w- where when you get to the heart of it, um, oftentimes they're just not subject to Christ first. And yeah. you find that out when you go to you, you you go to different parts of Scripture and you hear things like, oh, well, that was the Apostle Paul. He was a misogynist. Well, OK, so you've just discounted the writing of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Um, and so your your problem isn't actually with your husband. Your problem is first with Christ, with God, with the Holy Scriptures. Um, and, and so this presupp- presupposes that you're submitted to Christ first, and then that becomes a motivation. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, when, when you do marriage counseling, you're always trying to gauge from the very beginning, are, where are they with the Lord? Because it matters, Right. Absolutely. Yeah. People's walk uh, with the Lord makes all the difference. And we know that if we're walking with the Lord, if we're humbling himself uh, to his word, if we understand um, just the sinfulness in our hearts that we've got to do battle with each and every day, um, we'll be humble and teachable in that regard. And I remember one of my uh, professors um, in seminary, Tom Patton, who's also one of the pastors at Grace Community Church, um, he made a great point that when doing biblical counseling with couples, he knows that in the rare case where a couple comes in and and they each say, you know what, the problem is with me, pastor, I need you to help me to become a better husband, or I need you to help me to become a better wife. He, he says when they come with that kind of attitude, that the counseling is easy. It is really easy because they're teachable. All you've got to do is show them the word and, and they will, they, they will, they will correct, uh, they, they will correct themselves and and uh, be better in, in a very short period of time. The hardest thing is when people are pointing fingers at each other. Um, they're, they're flinging flaming arrows at each other. They're shooting at each other, um, rather than taking the responsibility of, um, of their own walk. And so I often tell people in counseling and especially some of the more difficult cases, um, I I will tell people, I said, I will say, you know what, if if just one of you, if just one of you had a consistent walk with the Lord, we probably wouldn't be here. Just one. And, And this, this actually bucks the um, the traditional thinking, because we often think, well, it takes two to make a make a successful marriage. And I don't want to discourage that because obviously we want two people both committed to the marriage. But the reality is this, if just one person is committed to Christ, that marriage is going to be much better. And yeah. there probably wouldn't be the the, the kind of finger pointing um, that's uh, that's going on back and forth. And and you bring up another point, and and this is a good point. The attack from the feminists, and and the like I said, th- this has seeped into the church, which shouldn't be a surprise because this is how Satan operates. He's going to bring manly thinking, man wisdom, man made wisdom into the scriptures, and use that to attack the scriptures. And so the counter to this from from a lot of women when they see this is they'll they'll come up with all kinds of exceptions as to when this shouldn't be the case. So I had had one wife that uh, came and said she wanted a divorce. And when I asked her, why do you want a divorce? She pointed to verse 25. You know, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. She said, my husband is not loving me the way Christ loved the church. And my response back was, well, if that's if that's the necessary exclusion, if that's the exception, if that's the condition there, then every single wife might as well go ahead and apply for a divorce because no husband is perfectly loving their wife the way Christ loves the church. But that's the command to the husband. We have to focus upon the command to the wife, yeah. and when we think about how Scripture is being undermined. You know, even I, I remember on Twitter, I think it was less than a year ago, maybe around a year ago, 
Um, I had talked about just by the grace of God, how many marriages um, I, I saw being saved, even at my own church, just as a result of biblical counseling. And the response back from at least one of them, and I think it was multiple, multiple of these kind of egalitarians and feminists, was that um, they didn't celebrate it. Um, they assumed that there was some sort of abuse going on. Right. Um, they assumed yeah. that yeah. that I was I, I was oppressing the women and and whatnot. But one of the reasons why, when we look at this passage in Ephesians, why I went back to verse fifteen is to remember that this starts off in the passage of be careful how you walk, mm. not as unwise men, but as wise. Yeah. Verse seven says, do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Verse 18 says, be filled with the spirit. So to hold to these scriptures, to trust in God, in his design for husbands and wives, one, it's to be wise. It's to not be foolish. It's to know the will of God, and it's to be filled by the spirit. And when we talk about, you know, once again, talking about this egalitarian versus complementarian, yes, verse 21 says, be subject to one another. And if Paul had just ended the letter there, you might have reason if you only had this passage to think that, yeah, there's mutual submission that needs to be going on. But that being subject to one another ends up being expanded from Ephesians 5.22 with the commandment to wives all the way through Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, I believe verse nine, at least, uh, and yeah. <clears throat> he's talking to wives and husbands. He's talking to children and parents, and he's talking to yeah. masters and slaves. And in none of those cases is the submission mutual. It's yeah. it's it, there's a very clear order, and I think that's by design, and that's by the grace of God. Because if you turn submission into being mutual, it ends up being chaos. There's no way around it. Um, there there has to be a very clear order, then, and God has provided us with that. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, the context of the previous verses is the whole body of Christ. It, 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 there's not been any hint of a specific relationship. Um, when, when you get into verse 21, that's still all of you, all of you Ephesians, yeah. all of you Christians be subject to one another. And then he goes in to specifics and starts yes. with wives. Right. And And so then he's defining now specific things. And we understand this because, you know, if you have children, then are you going to be OK with your children being totally subject to another married couple or another man or another woman? Right. No, of course not. Um, and, and so really, the issue here is a heart issue. If, if we're reading correctly, most of the twisting happens, I think, intentionally uh, because they wouldn't apply it to anything else. And then they, and I want to go through this and then maybe just deal with some hard marital issues just in general. Um, but understanding this is is important. You know, we've made the point that this, the being subject to your own husbands is not dependent upon the action of the husband. That's just an imperative. Wives, be subject to your own husband. Well, how do we do that or why do we do that? As to the Lord. And then in verse 22, it's important because, again, these distinctions, as you've mentioned, are very clear. For the husband is the head of the wife. There can only be one head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're wondering why that is, Paul's very gracious, and God's gracious through his word. He describes it further. As Christ also is the head of the church. So when we talk about the, the husband's headship, you can never view that apart from understanding the headship of Christ in his church, because that's what it's likened them to. And, and yeah. so when we start talking about who's subject to who and things like that, we always have to go back to, okay, well, this is in the same manner of Christ being the head of the church. And so that helps us understand that, right? And he goes on to say he himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ. Now, this is interesting because he says it one way, and now he's going to say the same thing in reverse order, right? He's restating himself, yeah. mm -hmm. right? But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Um, it, there really just is no way to be confused about this if you take the time to read what the scripture says and, and set, you know, kind of emotions aside and that sort of thing. Well, we've got to start with what the scripture teaches, and then we can bring it into practical life, real life. Um, right. And so uh, verse 23, the husband's the head of the wife. I mean, again, this is God's structure. This is God's doing. It can't be changed. It can't be revoked. It can't be 
nullified. Um, the, the only thing you can do is rebel against God in this. Right. And you made a really interesting statement um, when you were talking about the, was it Tom um, counseling? Yeah. It, you know, that's, that's the sign I think of whether or not you're humble, you have a humble heart. And, and if you, you know, if you could go to counseling and say, you know what, I, I, I know I'm failing. I know that I'm not living up to God's expectations of me in this relationship. And I really need to improve that. That that's the sign of humility. And when you don't have that, when you, you know, when your focus is on what the other person is doing right or wrong, then that's a good indication that you're not where you need to be. In fact, it's always an indication of you yeah. not being where you need to be. Right. And and I can guarantee and you would probably agree with me that if that's the mindset, a lot of the issues are coming from from that. Right. Not that the yeah. other person isn't playing part of that, but you can only deal with your sin before God and the other person can only deal with their sin before God. Uh, and so it's not that it, you're trying to fix each other. Now, in a healthy marriage, you certainly do point each other to Christ and you certainly do strengthen each other in your weaknesses and you cover sin by love. And that's all biblical. And it happens a, a bit more naturally uh, when you're both pursuing Christ firstly and foremost. Um, so, so we kind of got a good picture here, Eki, and I think, so now let's kind of back up a little bit and maybe consider the, the woman who is in a hard marriage, right? Um, maybe there's no physical abuse going on just for the sake of time. Uh, let's just assume that, uh, maybe the husband is just a hard man to get along with, right? Uh, maybe he, has an alcohol problem or whatever, but there's no abuse. There's no, that kind of thing, uh, physical abuse anyway, that sort of thing. Um, it, it, you know, how does that woman then approach these passages? We've really already talked about it, but there are a lot of women in the yeah. situation, right? Right. Right. And, uh, l and l let me, uh, let me comment first and then and then let you uh, correct me if I need to be corrected, but uh, <laughs> let you bring your wisdom in. You know, I think the first thing that, that I wish people would realize is their responsibility in getting into a relationship in the first place, right? Um, I, it, it's amazing how many people um, kind of shove to the side their own responsibility in sometimes engaging in a relationship they never should have to begin with, right? Um, and I think that's important to realize um, lots of girls, lots of women marry unbelievers. That's more common with women than I think with Christian men, um, thinking that they'll change them, that, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then the marriage becomes very difficult uh, and, and they don't want to stay in it. But but then the reality is you were disobedient to scripture in the first place, right? Not being equally right. yoked. And so you inserted yourself into a sinful relationship. And that's something that you have to take responsibility for. I think that's good to recognize, but then what do you do yeah. after that? Because I think recognizing that actually helps humble the heart, right? It, it helps yeah. not point the finger so much um, at the other person and at least recognizing first and foremost, well, Lord, maybe I wasn't as diligent as I should have been. Now you're married so you, you don't want to take that too far, obviously. Um, now, now you're married and you want to love your husband. You want to respect your husband. You want to submit to your husband. But I think that can be a humbling thing to say, actually, I, I played a part in this from the very beginning. Um, and, and then what, so what do you do from, from there? It's a difficult marriage. Uh, maybe wrong choices were made on the woman's part at the beginning. She recognizes that. Uh, what, what do you do? Because... The natural tendency is going to be, but Eki, he doesn't love me. He doesn't respect me. Yeah, he right. yells occasionally. He storms out the house angry and, and goes to get drunk. And how am I supposed to submit to that? Yeah, that's, you know, we, there, there's both the sovereignty of God as well as the responsibility of man. And so we, we recognize that God is sovereign in all things. We also recognize that we have responsibility in the choices that we make. And you're right. If um, someone has chosen unwisely to be in a relationship with an unbeliever, 
um, that's that's on them. And at the same time, they can also look back and and recognize that the sovereignty of God was at work in that. And when we think about the sovereignty of God, uh, the the first verse in the New Testament that probably comes to mind for most people is Romans eight twenty eight. Um, God causes all things to come together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But verse 29, don't forget verse 29, right after that, it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined um, to become conformed to the image of his son. Now, when we think about the fact that God causes all things, it's not just some things, it's not just most things, it's all things, even the things that you don't like, even the trials and the tribulations of your life, God causes them all for your good. And his goal in verse 29 is to make you more like Christ. And so what I tell wives in this situation, you know, they 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 made an unwise decision in marrying an unbeliever. Now they're dealing with the repercussions. And in many cases, some of these women, um, maybe they weren't even that solid in their faith when they made that decision, but they have since have grown. Um, they yeah. know more of the scriptures and and now they're they're coveting a little bit. They're they're thinking, you know what? If I just got out of this, um, I, I have better wisdom now. I would be able to choose a better husband, and I know things would be much, much better. But here's the thing. Um, God doesn't give you that exception clause, not not on that basis. And, yeah. and so the call from God is to trust in him. And if God causes all things for your good and his goal is to make you more like Christ— one of the things I tell both spouses, uh, but yeah, this in this case, we're talking about wives in a difficult marriage. What I will tell them is that your walk in holiness, to your growth into becoming more like Christ, starts right in the marriage that you're in. In fact, in fact, you keep thinking, and and so many people think that their spouse is the obstacle to their holiness. That um, oh, if it wasn't for my spouse, I'd be so much more holy. That is not the case at all. Uh, wh- whoever God has sovereignly given you. He has given you to actually expose the areas where you're mm. unholy, expose the areas where you need to grow. Yeah. So if you are truly interested in becoming more mm. like Christ, and, and all of us as Christians should desire to become more like Christ, that, that mm. is our goal here in, in, in life, is to become more like Christ. If we truly want to become more like Christ, recognize that doesn't happen in a vacuum. That that doesn't happen simply by just reading books or 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 just by by meditating. Um, that that happens through the trials that God gives us. That happens through these difficulties that God calls upon us to depend upon Him, to trust in His sovereignty um, in those situations. And that's exactly the way um, the woman needs to see it in such a difficult marriage. That the the question is this: Okay, how can you glorify God as a woman mm-hmm. of God and as a wife of God, regardless of where your husband is at? How can you show your husband? Um, the, the love and, and the grace of God in his life. How can you um, help to support him and to, and to respect him better, to submit to him better, and to help him feel, um, feel supported uh, at, in a one-flesh relationship, regardless of where he is in his walk with Christ? Those are the questions that really should be on the mind of wives going through these difficult yeah. relationships. But because of the flesh, we understand mm-hmm. it. We, we understand that those are not always the questions that come to mind. But this is exactly why we need to go to the scriptures, and I believe that's exactly what the scriptures show us. I mean, that's a that's a powerful thing. Uh, the, the difficult husband that that the wife lives with is actually an instrument of her righteousness and holiness. I, I mean, that's yeah. powerful. That's entirely flipped on its head in in our natural state, right? We don't view it that way. And it is interesting. Even if you did view your husband as the enemy, fine. Scripture says, "Love your enemies." So love your right. husband. Um, right. it, 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 you know, I mean, e- even if you deal, did feel persecuted, you know, what does the scripture say? Uh, right. Yeah. We don't we don't persecute those who persecute us. We pray for them. Right. And so even if all those things were true, if you just applied everything else we know about scripture, they would apply to your husband. Are you yeah. doing those things? Right. I mean, it, you know, the, the call to the Christian faith. And, and I think we've talked about this before, but. Even in marriage, we need to understand that sometimes in God's providence and God's sovereignty, they're suffering. Um, and ultimately, as you've said, that's for our good. I mean, Jesus said, pick up your cross, deny yeah. yourself and follow me. And I think in the Western mm-hmm. world, what we need a good dose of is that your marriage isn't about you. You know, yep. for husbands and right. wives. Um, I, and and we ought to strive and tolerate um, as much as humanly possible and everything that would be right and appropriate to tolerate 
in a marriage for the sake of the beauty of it being a reflection of Christ in his church. Right. And, and that's why we go, I mean, you, you go back to understanding that you submit to your husband as unto the Lord and that it's pleasing to the Lord. And we've said it before, but we should say it again that, you know, we're not talking about being made to sin. Obviously we don't yeah. do that. Right. Um, but even then, um, you, you respond in a godly manner, right? I mean, you just think of the apostles who were brought, uh, you know, in, in front of the congregation, the church leaders, and told not to preach in Jesus's name. Um, they, they responded, right, firmly, but graciously. Uh, they, they didn't go out fist fighting and things like that. They said, right. well, you know, um, as for us, you know, we, we must rather obey God. God they than, were bold, yeah. right? They were bold with that. Yeah, they were bold. It. Yeah, right. They they were bold. Um, and, and so there's even right ways to respond to that. But you know, the idea of divorce ought to be the very last, last. I mean, that should even never really enter the mind. Um, yeah. a, 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 and until that should be the mindset. We just we're married. This is meant to be a reflection of Christ and His Church. And I'm going to do everything I can to be the most godly person in this marriage. I mean, just imagine if both people had yeah. that mindset, what the marriage right. would be like. A and, you know, I want, if anyone were to see our marriage from the outside, I want Christ to be honored. At the very least, I want Christ to be honored in my response, um, you know, in in how I react to my husband and how I serve my husband. Um, it, you know, and so it's meant to be a very beautiful thing. It's been corrupted because of sin, but then Christ calls us to suffer with him and for his sake. And sometimes that's in, in marriage. Um, and I think if we, you know, you consider Paul, Paul was, uh, given a thorn in the flesh by God, right? Now I'm not comparing the thorn in the flesh to your husband. Uh, don't, but, but just to say, um, the idea here is not that God's going to give us a life without any, any without any suffering, right? I mean, that thorn in the flesh was clearly something that was an irritant to Paul at the very least. He cries out to God multiple times to remove it. So it was yeah. a hindrance. It was a pain. Um, and yet it was God's way of humbling Paul and keeping him dependent upon his own grace and his own strength. Um, and so I think we just need to uh, view those time periods where marriage is difficult um, as a way to grow in our own holiness and for God's glory. You know, and you'll probably agree with this. Usually, I mean, selfishness is always at the center of issues, right? Uh, the marriage has become all about me. And when that's become the issue, then it's your own heart. It's actually not your spouse. Uh, wh whatever the husband may be doing, um, once it becomes all about you, the, the, that's the problem. That's the issue. And you become your own hindrance to holiness and to godliness. And you become your own hindrance to the blessing of God that he may have for you in submitting to his design in the midst of a difficult situation, right? Right. Yeah, I just um, this past uh, Sunday, and I do I teach a Sunday school class on biblical counseling, and I just covered the topic of pride um, this past Sunday. Yes, pride is at the center of all of our sins, uh, really, and uh, within the within relationships, um, this is the major cause for why there are breaks in relationships, why there are tensions and, and strife, because exactly that uh, you're you're thinking about yourself and. I, I like a quote that was shared with me, and, and um, I, I don't know who originated the quote, but it was essentially um, this. Humility is not, it's not thinking less of yourself so much as it is thinking of yourself less, right? It, in other words, the idea is it's not that you're going to, you know, humility is not intentionally putting yourself down um, to be less valuable than other people. And that's that's not the idea. Um, humility is is simply thinking about other people more often than yourselves and, and valuing their needs even more than you value yourselves, because that's when community works the best. Um, th those are commands that are given to the church, right? Philippians 2, um, treat the needs of others as more important than yourselves. And, and that's what Paul is requesting of them before he uses uh, Jesus Christ as being the ultimate example. But if that's true for the church, that's even more true for the marriage relationship, where we want to be thinking of other people. Now, 
immediately when I say that, we have a tendency to say, well, yeah, my spouse is not doing that. Well, no, that's not the point. The point of that statement is, are you doing that, yeah. right? And are you doing it unconditionally? You know, it's not about whether your spouse is doing doing it or not. It's whether you are doing it. And and yeah, you you made uh, the you know you'd you'd said, hey, make it your goal to be the most holy one in the relationship. And and this is not a obviously it's not a competition. We're not trying to make right. this a competition, but we are trying to uh, we're we're trying to encourage you to be as as Christ like as possible because this is about glorifying God. And, and Jesus Christ. And I can tell you that in difficult marriage situations, and this has been the case 100% of the time, okay? When there are dissensions, when there are disputes, when there are complaints, at various times I have asked the question, where is Christ in all of this? When they're recounting to me what's gone on in the past week and how they responded in anger or frustration or whatnot, I'll ask them, where was Christ in all of this? And, and I tell you what, 100% of the time, they're not walking with Christ. Uh, most of the time, e even those who are the most prideful will admit uh, he wasn't there. Well, why wasn't he there? And and that's that's where you, you've got to do some heart surgery, some spiritual heart surgery. Because the reason why Christ wasn't there, it wasn't because of your spouse. Christ wasn't there because of you. And by the way, Christ is omniscient. We we know he is he's omniscient, he's, omni he's omnipresent. We know he's always there, but he wasn't there in terms of you recognizing his presence. He wasn't there in terms of his presence being an influence upon your thinking. He wasn't there in terms of he wasn't the person that you went to in prayer, right? And and oftentimes during these difficult periods too, um, how you pray to God about your situation is going to be huge in all this. Because are you simply just praying for your spouse or are you praying to God, um, search my heart, Help show me the ways in which I'm falling short. Help show me the ways in which I can be, become more like Christ. Um, because when when we start to get too focused upon our own rights, um, what we're not getting, what we should be getting, what we're used to getting, and, and the way the other person is behaving, our mind is already on the wrong place. Our mind needs to be on Christ. How can I glorify Jesus Christ? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as we kind of wrap up here, speaking about praying for difficult husbands, you know, there there are the the, the common prayer is Lord change him, uh, Lord make yeah. him stop doing this, Lord make him stop doing that. I I think, you know, here's the reality: you're you're married to a man who maybe he's difficult, maybe he is very difficult. Um, you ought to have no less compassion and love for him than you do the lost in the world. And certainly you don't pray like that for the lost in the world, right? Yeah. And, and in fact, your your heart and your compassion ought to be even greater towards this man that you've married, this man that, by the way, God has ordained to be your husband. Um, and, and so prayers ought to, and I think this is a good way to gauge your heart, is, you know, Lord, open his eyes so that he sees the beauty of Christ. Yeah. You know, um, Lord, give him a heart for the things of God. Father, help break his uh, a, a addiction to these things that are seeking to destroy his soul. I mean, that, that's an entirely different type of prayer. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and and it's it's got to be heartfelt and it's got to be meant. And when it is, I, I think you'll find and, and you've probably had this experience when women pray for their husbands like that. God's working in their own heart, and they yeah. start to find that maybe it's not that it's necessarily easier to submit, but they find a love and a strength and a joy in it that wasn't yeah. there before. And it doesn't mean that, you know, and it may be that the marriage is going to be a difficult one for the rest of your days. And I, I hate to say that, but that's just life here in a broken, fallen world. The question is, when you stand before God as a wife and you give an account for all the things you've done and all the things you've said, will you be able to say that Christ was glorified, magnified yeah. in your marriage because you strived uh, to, to submit to your husband as unto the Lord? And I think that's where for marriages that are very difficult, where there doesn't seem to be hope, that's that's where your mind has to go. Any last thoughts, Eki? Oh, no. Amen and amen. I think that's uh, very beautifully stated.
And uh, we, we didn't talk about the case where husbands may be violent. And we actually did an entire episode where we talked about physical abuse. Um, so you can look that up in, in one of our past episodes. Uh, we're not saying women are to endure even physical abuse. In those cases, talk to your elder, talk to your pastor. Um, for, for me personally, I, I'm, I'm going to think about the safety of the wife and, uh, yeah, and separate absolutely. those two um, and get to the bottom of, of what's going on there, why the husband is that way. Um, so that, that becomes a different, a whole different situation. We're just talking about the difficult situations that, that don't involve that where, and then look, marriage is going to be difficult. Um, even the most successful marriages, um, I know of, um, started off with a lot of difficulties and, and were, um, were, were kind of uh, polished over time, just, just through the trials that came into, into life. But all of this comes down to this. Um, do you trust God enough to obey Mm -hmm. him? Um, regardless of what the circumstances are, if you do that, um, then, then God's going to be glorified. And and wives, if you start to see that Jesus is changing your heart, that that you really are finding joy even in contentment in difficult circumstances, that you're able to submit to and respect your husband and to support him even when he's being a difficult husband, I, I tell you what, I I can't guarantee you that. The marriage is not going to be difficult from that point on, but I can say this, that your husbands will notice. Um, they, they will notice uh, a wife who is modeling Jesus Christ, and, uh, and and that's going to be a great testimony to him. And as you keep praying for the, your husband's salvation or, or that his walk with the Lord would improve, um, the, the greatest service that you can do for him is to be like Christ. Amen and amen. Well, I hope that this has been helpful to you. Until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.